You're watching Eye on Africa here on Live from Paris on France 24. I'm Shona Bhattacharya. Thanks so much for tuning in. Let's take a look at our top stories in this edition. Just a few days left before Sunday's presidential election in Cameroon. Incumbent Paul Bia is confident he'll win, extending his 36-year rule. He's being called the ghost candidate and made his first appearance on the campaign trail this week. A few months behind schedule, Kenya announced its 2018-2019 budget, but some are voicing their opposition to new taxes on the poor that they say will leave them even more vulnerable. And celebrating South Africa's Indian community with a dish. Bunny Chow combines curry with bread and tells the story of one of the country's main minority groups and how it's come into its own far from its homeland. He's being called the invisible candidate, but there's little doubt Paul Bia is in fact very present in Cameroon's presidential campaign. The 85-year-old is expected to extend his 36-year rule with another term when voters head to the polls this Sunday. Cameroon is facing two major hurdles, the Anglophone separatist movement, as well as the fight against Boko Haram. For his only appearance on the campaign trail so far, Bia visited the far north region that's facing both crises. Our team on the ground brings you this report. In his first outing since campaigns were launched on the 22nd of September, President Paul Bia's Marwa campaign was broadcast live on state TV. Over six years since his last visit to the far north region of Cameroon, outgoing President Paul Bia went back there this week to crusade for votes ahead of Sunday's presidential polls. In a region which has suffered recurrent attacks from the radical Boko Haram sect for the past five years, the flag bearer of the ruling CPDM party chose to address the two-year-old anglophone crisis. All we have to do now is ensure peace reigns in the northwest and southwest regions which are under constant attacks from secessionists. At the Yaoundé Central Market, like elsewhere in the country, tens of campaigns of the ruling party are held in the absence of the presidential candidate. Party supporters are not bothered by the absence of their nominee, who has been described as a ghost candidate by the opposition. He is not a ghost candidate. He is present with us as we speak. Paul Bia is with us. He's always with us. The brain behind the rally grouping close to 2,000 party supporters is a former member of parliament of Bia's party. <laughs> Jean Maringa Kunda denies Paul Bia is absent in the public eye. The head of state has taught us how to handle things and do them very well. As you can see, we do not have to bribe the people with money or drinks. The people do not need extra convincing. They just want to vote for the head of state. Despite his absence, scores of government ministers and other state dignitaries were present to witness the presentation of a re-released book in honor of President Bia. We are re-releasing the book, Community Liberalism. Paul Bia has proven that all he has done and what he continues to do is all good and convincing. 85-year-old President Paul Bia, who has been president of Cameroon for 36 years, seeks a seventh term in office. He is up against eight other presidential candidates in the decisive October 7 presidential elections. On Wednesday, Bia received the support of one of Cameroon's biggest football stars, Samuel Eto, who called on his fans to do the same. But they had mixed reactions. I think Samuel Eto is a Cameroonian like any other, so he has the right to express himself like any other person. And Paul Bia is a candidate like any other candidate, so Eto is free to support whoever he wants. Paul Bia is not necessarily a favorite from what we've seen recently. So young people, people who follow Samuel Eto, see this choice as a betrayal. Malawi greeted Melania Trump with open arms. The U.S. First Lady visited a primary school in the capital, Lilongwe, accompanied by Malawi's First Lady, Gertrude Mutarika. A small group of Americans living in the Southeast African country protested her visit, though, especially uh, her husband's style and policies. This is the first time Melania Trump is representing the U.S. administration on a solo international trip. She'll be visiting four countries overall. Next up. Kenya.
Zimbabwe is being hit with its worst cholera outbreak in a decade. Since the outbreak began, 49 people have died. The government has begun a vaccination campaign to inoculate some 1.4 million people, starting with those in the most densely populated areas. This after appealing for help from inside the country to raise $35 million to buy vaccines, medicine, and to repair water and sewer pipes. Back in 2008, cholera killed more than 4,000 people and had infected another 40,000. Better late than never. The Kenyan government has just finalized its 2018-2019 budget three months behind schedule. But now that it's been announced, many in the country are having mixed reactions. Some say new taxes will further hurt the country's poorest. Our team on the ground brings you this report. The cost of living is rising sharply in Kenya. The 2018 Finance Act introduces a VAT on petroleum products and increases the price of money transfers made by phone. Dennis, a second-hand shoe salesman, is usually paid by M-Pesa, the mobile banking system used by nearly 50 percent of Kenyans. After work, he goes to the kiosk to withdraw his earnings. We have new rates of M-Pesa. Yeah, we had new rates. New rates, eh? Yeah. In this neighborhood, residents regularly make small transfers using the M-Pesa app. Yeah, that is born. They were, they, were being, they, were charging, they were being charged 27. Then they have an additional one shilling. It is too much for them. The average salary in Kenya is around 100 euros. No matter how small, any increase is a strain on the poorest. It's difficult, yeah. We have to dig deeper to our pockets. The aim of the new taxes is to halt the growing Kenyan debt, which totals more than 56 percent of GDP. But according to this economist, most Kenyans don't understand the payoff. There is a very clear sense in the Kenyan public that we're not getting value for money and that a lot of the money that is sent into public coffers ends up being used for private gain and, and for corrupt gains. The presidential party's bill has sown discord within the opposition. Some members opposed it and disrupted debates on the floor. But the president of the Orange Democratic Party voted for it. We have conditions from our lenders, people who want to renegotiate our loans and restructure them, that if we don't show serious commitment in bridging the uh, deficit gap, the budget deficit gap, that they would not be willing to cooperate with us. MPs who voted against the law promise their fight will continue. They filed a motion to invalidate it with Kenya's attorney general. Embracing heritage and culture through food. Bunny chow is a dish attributed to South Africa's Indian community, but it's not Indian. Its history and ingredients help tell their story of people who were brought over an ocean and made a new life for themselves, becoming an integral part of South African culture. Nicholas Germain has more. A hollowed out loaf of bread filled with curry. This Indian dish is called bunny chow, but you won't find it in India. It was created by Indian immigrants in South Africa. Most of them live here in Durban. The pungentness of it is just awesome. The first Indians were sent here by the British colonizers 140 years ago to work mostly in sugarcane fields. In recent decades, the Indian community's economic progress has risen much faster than that of many native Africans. This analyst also says that Indian South Africans are very different from their cousins on the subcontinent. Very few Indian South Africans speak any Indian language. Um, uh, an incredible amount of uh, Indian South Africans married across religious lines and, and caste and class lines. These uh, uh, things sound small, but they are dramatic. Some say having a double culture is not always easy. I think we consider ourselves very much South African but with an Indian heritage. And so I think that's quite unique. I think a lot of people grapple with that, especially when you're young, because you're told by older people in your family that you're very much Indian, you have to know the language, you have to know um, the culture very well, but then everything around you tells you you're living in South Africa and you're quite South African. Indian South Africans represent 2.5% of the country's 55 million people. In Durban, they account for nearly a quarter of all residents. And we end on a musical note. Tributes are pouring in for Joseph, Joseph Kamaru. The Kenyan singer died in a Nairobi hospital. He was 79 years old and had advanced Parkinson's disease. 
Kamaru sang in the Kukuyu language and recorded close to 2,000 songs, many of which addressed social issues, morality, and life lessons. That's it for this edition. Do stay with us. There's more news coming up on France 24.